You have questions? The Bible has answers. This program, overseen by the Philip Street Church of Christ, is dedicated to answering your questions with God's Word. Please join us for the period of study as we seek to give a Bible answer. And now, here is your moderator. Hello everyone, welcome to A Bible Answer. I'm Mike McDaniel and I'm the preacher for the Central Church of Christ in Carothersville, Missouri. Thanks for watching this program today. It's overseen by the good elders of the Phillips Street Church of Christ in Dyersburg, Tennessee, and 33 congregations of the Churches of Christ support this program financially to bring it to you. We're glad you're watching. Please tell other people about it. We have three gospel preachers with us to answer your questions. We'll have them introduce themselves to you once again. I'm Skip Andrews from the Evergreen Street Church in Dresden, Tennessee. I'm Mike Peters with the Pottsville Church of Christ in Hickory, Kentucky. I'm David Gulledge from the Whitlock Church of Christ in Paris, Tennessee. At the halfway point of our program, and again at the end, you'll see our contact information. Please be ready for that so that you can send us your Bible question. Here are the questions for today. Our first question for Brother Andrews. Please explain the meaning of the scapegoat in Leviticus 16. Brother Andrews. I thank you for this question. There are questions that we get sometimes in this uh, venue that we've never had before and maybe never studied very much at all. And this is one of them for me. I went to the Hebrew, not that I'm a scholar, and read page after page about the roots of this particular word. And I hope that this brief answer will give you some very interesting thoughts to think about with regard to this Day of Atonement, which is in Leviticus 16. Leviticus has 27 chapters in it, and my outline of it is very simple. The first 16 chapters are how to come to God, and the last 11, how to stay with God. This is the dividing part of the book, chapter 16. This word scapegoat is found in the King James four times in this chapter and nowhere else in the entire Bible. Some translations you might have where you will have the word Azazel, A-Z-A-Z-E-L, which is the Hebrew word. I don't know if that's pronounced correctly, but that is the, the word that's used here that's translated scapegoat, and it's only those four times. So I want to look at those quickly. In verse 8, it says, Aaron shall cast lots upon the two goats. So two were required, one lot for the Lord or one, and one, the other lot for the scapegoat. So one of these goats would be presented to the Lord and that would be offered as a sacrifice. It was going to be slaughtered. And the other, something else is happening which has this word scapegoat attached to it. The word Azazel, according to what I checked, and this is working through it all, seems to mean literally the goat that is sent away. And in verse 10, it comes up again and used twice in this verse. But the goat on which the lot fell to be the scapegoat shall be presented alive before the Lord to make an atonement with him and to let him go for a scapegoat in the wilderness. So in verse 10, this one goat is alive still and is taken before the Lord and he is going to be, the English says here, let go into the wilderness as a scapegoat, whatever that means. Now then in verse 26, we have the last time where this is used. And he that let go the goat for the scapegoat shall wash his clothes and bathe his flesh in the water and afterward come into the camp. That kind of hints that there's something about this that comes up between these last two references because here's someone who has let the scapegoat go in the wilderness and we haven't read about him yet. So we go back to verses 20 to 22 and we learn what I think will be the real answer to this. When he hath made an end of reconciling the holy place and the tabernacle of the congregation and the altar, he shall bring the live goat. And Aaron shall lay both his hands upon the head of the live goat and confess over him all the iniquities of the children of Israel. Now this day of atonement was once a year. So all that had happened that was offensive to God within the last year is now on the burden 
figuratively, of this goat. One animal is bearing all of it. And all their transgressions, in all their sins, putting them upon the head of the goat, and shall send him away by the hand of a fit man into the wilderness. So that's that man in verse 26. Somebody is a fit man, whatever that means. He's chosen to be suitable to do this. And the goat shall bear upon him all their iniquities unto a land not inhabited, and he shall let go the goat in the wilderness. So this scapegoat is at least figuratively bearing all of the burdens of the sin and transgressions for the past year committed by everybody in Israel. And he's being sent away. Interestingly enough, the New Testament term for remission or forgiveness, and those are the same word, means to send away. And so these two goats, one that's offered as a sacrifice that would die, obviously he could not bear the sins away, he's dead. And the second one that is spared to do that figurative action of taking those sins away represent how sin is dealt with through the blood and the resulting sending away of the sins. And there's no description of whatever happened to this goat. It's like it's gone forever, which is exactly what happens when our sins are forgiven. I'd invite you to take the time to read the last chapter of Hebrews to get some ideas about how that letter concludes so many things about the priesthood and sacrifice of Christ, which are rooted in the book of Leviticus. And I think you'll be impressed by what that chapter has to say. And I do thank you for this question. And thanks for that interesting answer. Now to Brother Peters. The person says, some say the perfect is the Bible in 1 Corinthians 13, 8. Isn't that passage referring to the only one who is perfect, Jesus Christ? When that happens, tongues will cease because we will be in His presence. We will not need prophecy and knowledge because He will reveal all things to us. The things that are imperfect will be done away when we see the perfection that will come in Jesus Christ. And I believe he's referring there to Christ's second coming in the question. So, Brother Peters, will you deal with that, please? Gladly. I think the confusion comes from our definition of the word perfect. Uh, we use the word in two different ways. Uh, we can use it to mean flawless, or in this case, sinless. And you are right, Jesus Christ is the sinless one. Uh, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. You're not going to find a sinless man on this earth. But we use the term in a second way as well. If someone is training for something, we might say as they are finishing their training, well, they have perfected this skill. And it's not necessarily meaning they can do it perfectly, but they've completed. When we go back to the original language in and verse 10 of chapter 13 says, But when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part, a reference to the miraculous gifts of the first century, shall be done away. The word translated there is from the Greek word teleos, and it means completed or complete. So, when that which is completed is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. The word here doesn't refer to someone who is sinless or flawless in that sense of perfect, but it's dealing with something that is completed, something complete. So Paul is saying that the miraculous gifts, that speaking in a language I've never studied, that uh, gift of prophecy, those miraculous healings, those miraculous gifts of the first century would be done away with. They would cease when the completed is come. So the reference is not to the sinless Christ, but to the completed, revealed Word of God. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, not sinless, not flawless, but complete, mature, truly furnished unto all good works. Well, what does that mean for me? It means that I can take the Bible, God's Word, and I can open up His Word and see His will for me. See what I have to do in order to be reconciled to God and to have my sins taken off of my record, to be forgiven of those things. I can open up my Bible and see how He wants me to live. 
I can open up my Bible and see how He wants me to speak and to deal with others. The Bible is God's revealed will for mankind, and as a result, we no longer have a need for those miraculous gifts. Thank you for that question. Thank you so much. You know, when you understand that verses 9 and 10 go together, and that in verse 9 he's talking about partial revelation, whatever those parts are, they make up the completed whole in verse 10. Uh, anything else, and it doesn't fit the context. And so it's pretty obvious then that Paul's subject was the receiving and the dispensing of divine knowledge, the, the proclamation of the New Testament faith by inspiration. We've reached the halfway point of our program today. We want to offer you a tract, and our free tract today is Hearing God in the 21st Century. If you'd like to have our free tract today, or if you'd like to receive our correspondence course offer, if, uh, if you request it, we'll send you the first lesson from this uh, series on the Church of the Bible. If you'll fill that out and study with your Bible, send it back to us, we'll send you lesson two. If you complete the course, we'll send you a certificate for having completed it. So if you'd like the tract or the course or both, or if you'd like to send us your question, please contact us. Write us at Phillip Street Church of Christ, 912 Phillip Street, Dyersburg, Tennessee, 38024. Email us at a Bible answer at earthlink.net. Call our toll-free number 1-800-436-0463 and give us your address and we'll send you your materials. Or also contact us by our webpage. We encourage people to go to our webpage and uh, that uh, web address uh, is appearing now on the screen, www.abibleanswertv.org. So we encourage you to go there today. Now back to our questions. Brother Gulledge, this is your next question today. What does it mean that the heavens declare the glory of God? Brother Gulledge. Thank you for the question. The question, as far as I understand, comes from Psalm 19 and verse 1, which reads, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth His handiwork. To answer this question, I want to pull two words out of the verse and out of the question that I think will help us to understand what is being said here and to answer the question. Uh, the first word I want to pull out is heavens. I want you to notice that in the text the word heavens is of course plural. Uh, truish, uh, Jewish tradition holds that there were three heavens. There, they considered there to be three heavens. The uh, space where the birds fly, where the clouds are. Uh, the second heaven would be what we refer to today as perhaps outer space where the sun, the moon, and the stars are. And then the third heaven is the divine or spiritual realm wherein God resides. You know, I have even heard that they considered there to be four heavens. The third heaven to be paradise or the place of waiting, and then the fourth heaven being where God resides. However, whether there's three or four that the Jews considered to be uh, we are focusing on the first two, which are visible to you and I today, where the birds fly, where the, the clouds are, and then outer space where the sun, the moon, and the stars are. And so the heavens, thinking about the first two heavens, the heavens, all right, that's the first thing I want us to consider. Now, what do they do? They show the glory of God. And so when we consider those first two heavens, they show the glory. Well, when we think about the glory of God, uh, there are several attributes that constitute God's glory. We could think about God's wisdom, God's power, God's skill, God's compassion. And all of these are attributes that constitute God's glory. Now, I believe the psalmist here in Psalm 19.1, his emphasis is upon God's power. Whenever you and I look at the heavens, we look at the space where the birds fly, the clouds, the sun, the moon, the stars and scientists today are, are realizing just how vast and how large the, the, the heavens, the space is, and how many stars there are in the sky. And whenever you and I look at those heavens, they show God's power. They show His handiwork. Uh, if you were to go to my house and you would walk out on a, on a clear night, you can look up into the sky and you can see the number of stars that are in the night sky. And they surely do show His glory and His power. Whenever you and I 
uh, live in a world like we do today, full of the teaching of evolution, teaching that everything that you and I see is the process of a big bang and over millions of years everything has evolved. How can that be? When you and I can see the, uh, the power of God and His creation, we look at the complexity of everything around us and we can simply see that there has to be an intelligent design behind everything. And so the psalmist says that the heavens... The space around us, the stars, the heavens, they show the power, the glory of God. And I think that's what the psalmist is indicating there in the passage, and I hope that this answers your question. Thank you. We have this question for Brother Andrews. Is 1 Corinthians 2, 9 describing heaven, or is it describing inspiration? Brother Andrews. Again, we're grateful for the question, and I'd like to do a little overview of this entire chapter the first part of 1 Corinthians, Paul, I think, is laying the foundation of information that would help them solve the problems he's about to address, which became a very long list. In chapter 2, we have 16 verses. In the beginning of it, in verses 1 and 2, Paul addresses the message that he brought when he went to Corinth the first time, back in Acts 18. He said, I came to you not with human wisdom or excellency of speech, but I came with a message about Christ and Him crucified. So that's the first thing to note. He's talking about the Word of God. In verses 3, 4, and 5, he talks about the source or power of that was not, again, his own abilities. He says, I came with weakness, fear, and much trembling. My speech and preaching was not with enticing words of man. In other words, it all came from the wisdom of God. He came with miraculous abilities to present to him, them the wisdom of God. So there we're still talking about the message. And then in verses 6, 7, and 8, he makes it clear to them that this wisdom of God had been a mystery, but now it was no longer because it's been revealed. So in verses 1 through 8, he's talking about the message of God and how he got it and then presented it to them. The last part of the chapter is where we have our question in verse 9, as it is written, I hath not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. Since he's been talking about the word of God in the eight, first eight verses, it would seem to be fitting that he's still doing that, especially since in verses 10 to 16, he continues to talk about the word of God and how it is the source of information from which they learned the gospel and now can solve all of these problems. But if you'll also notice, verse 9 starts by saying, as it is written. Paul is quoting someone else when he writes that. And the someone else is Isaiah in Isaiah 64 and verse 4. If you go back and read that passage, you'll see that Isaiah is also talking about the message of God in that text. Most of the prophets end their books with a ray of hope about a message of God that was yet future, which is the New Testament. And so even in Isaiah, where we have this statement first made, it's about the Word of God. Now, obviously heaven has characteristics that sound like verse 9. But the context of this whole chapter is he's talking about the inspiration that he and others had in order to reveal the entire New Testament, including the words about heaven. But this is talking about inspiration, and thank you for asking. Thank you. And that verse is often misapplied. Now, Brother Peters, this is a, a most interesting question from a viewer. I have one of the most unglamorous jobs in the world, I clean hotel rooms. Some people look down their noses at me because I have such a low level job. So does my work matter to God or is it merely a way to pay the bills and buy groceries? Brother Peters. Romans 2 and verse 11, for there is no respect of persons with God. Because God is not a respecter of persons, we can't be as well. We need to 
uh, stop doing that, quite frankly. James 2 warns about this problem, about respecting people based on how they look or, or how wealthy they are. Uh, he paints a picture of a rich man walking into the assembly and everybody fawning all over him. He's dressed to the nines and they want him in this, this spot that's just right down front so everyone can see who is here. And yet the poor man, when he walks in, well, they say, oh, you just go stand back in the back. Uh, that's verse 3. You have respect to him that weareth the gay clothing, and say unto him, Sit thou here in a good place, and say to the poor, Stand thou there, or sit here under my footstool. In verses 8 and 9, he concludes this thought by saying, If you fulfill the royal law according to the Scripture, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, you do well. But if you have respect of persons, you commit sin and are convinced of the law as transgressors. Now think about that for a moment. If we truly love our neighbor as ourselves, the word love there means that we're going to take care to the best of our ability. We're going to look out for their best interest and treat them in such a way as we would want to be treated if we were in their place. And no one wants to be looked down on. Uh, I don't want to be looked down on. You don't want to be looked down on based on how I look or how much I weigh or what I do for a living. And it's quite frankly sinful to do so. It's a sinful attitude. God looks at the rich and the poor in the same way. He's not interested in outward appearances. He's not interested in how much money you have in the bank, how prestigious your job is. He's interested in your heart and whether or not you have submitted your life to Him and whether or not you are faithful and obedient to Him. Our jobs are a blessing from God. It helps allow us to provide for our families and we should look upon them as a blessing and not be ashamed to, to have an honest job doing an honest work for an honest day's wage. Thank you for that question. You know, this very night, the night of, of my taping, I'm going to be spending the night in a hotel, in a hotel room. And I hope that that room is clean properly when I enter it. And I'll be grateful to God if it is. No matter what job we may have, the Bible teaches us that we ought to do it as if we were doing it for the Lord. And uh, our work needs to be for Him uh, in, in a good occupation so that we can say that and give glory to God in what we do and seek to honor Him in the way that we work. Our next question to Brother Gulledge, 1 Corinthians 16, 2 says we're to give as we've been prospered. Please discuss that, Brother Gulledge. Thank you for the question. <clears throat> when we look at 1 Corinthians 16, 2, the phrase, as he may prosper, is used about our giving. Again, in Acts 11, verse 29, we read about the first century church giving according to their ability to give. And so when we consider giving today as Christians that we do each Lord's Day, we should give as we prosper or according to our own ability. And so my ability differs from others' abilities. And the way that I prosper is different than the way others prosper. And so I'm to give according to my ability and the way that I prosper. And so it's a personal responsibility. Now when we consider giving, it's amazing to me when we look at the example of the first century church in 2 Corinthians 8 and verse 3, there was an occasion when they gave beyond their ability. And sometimes that is the case as well. And one example that comes to my mind is the woman with two mites that Jesus admired in the temple when she gave two mites and that was all that she had. She is an example of a person that gave beyond her ability. And so that is sometimes the case as well. But as a standard, we are to give according to the way that we prosper. Now, when we look at that phrase, uh, it is actually one word in the Greek, uh, as he may prosper. It's one word. And it carries with it the idea, basically, of a prosperous journey. A prosperous journey. As you travel through this life, and as you prosper week by week, you are to give a portion of that to the Lord's work, 
through the church uh, according to your ability and not much uh, and not more is expected of you and not and certainly not less. And so to give according to your ability that you prosper as the Lord blesses you, give back to him a portion of that. The more that one is prospered, the more he is to give. The less that one prospers, less is required. It is the same teaching that Christ taught and the same principle in Luke chapter 12 and verse 48 where Jesus said, To whomever much is given of him, much shall be required. And so you and I, as we prosper, we are to be a good steward of what we receive. Of course, it is a blessing from the Lord. And the way that we prosper, we are to sit down and we are to determine uh, how much is to be given to the Lord according to our ability and to give to Him according to that standard. And so when we look at that phrase, it's personal. The way that you prosper, the Lord prospers you with blessings. Uh, give according to your ability. And sometimes it's the case where people give beyond that ability. And of course, that's a personal decision as well. And so I think that when we look at this uh, command in 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 2, it, it, it's an easy uh, command to understand, I think, that is you prosper according to your ability. That is the standard in which you and I need to give. And I hope that this is a, a good answer to your good question. I, uh, I like the poem that goes, Once there was a Christian who had a pious look. His consecration was complete, except his pocketbook. He put a dollar in the plate, then sang with might and main. When we asunder part, it gives me inward pain. A lot of people are that way. But Christians are to give with a willing mind. You know, in 2 Corinthians 8 and verse 12, For if there be first a willing mind, it is accepted according to that he hath, and not according to that he hath not. God loves everyone, but God has a special love for the cheerful giver. 2 Corinthians 9 and verse 7. God wants us to give cheerfully. And since each of us wants God to love us, we ought to give cheerfully to the work of the Lord. We're thankful to all the congregations that support this congregation and give cheerfully that we can be on the air. Thanks for watching. And remember, for your Bible questions, there's always a Bible answer. We would love to hear from you, our viewers. If you have questions for A Bible Answer, or if you'd like any of the material offered on this program, please contact us at the address on the screen. We appreciate all of our supporters, and we encourage you to worship with the Faithful Church of Christ in your area.